We have a lot of folks in, so let's go ahead and get started. And I am so excited to introduce uh, these two lovely women, women with us. They probably don't need any introduction. But first, I am Kelly Thompson. I'm a career coach, an author, and speaker. I'm so excited to be moderating today's panel. We're talking all about stress awareness. Today is Stress Awareness Day. And we're with Ariana Huffington and Padmasri Warrior. Thank you for joining us. I know this is going to be a special conversation. And so today, Ariana and Padma are two powerful female leaders who have put mental health and well-being at the center of their careers. Ariana Huffington is the founder and CEO of Thrive Global, the co-founder of The Huffington Post, and the author of 15 books. She has been named to Time Magazine's list of the world's 100 most influential people and the Forbes most powerful women list. Ariana has been a passionate advocate for mental well-being, especially in the context of work. She, wore, she wrote a memoir, Thrive, about her own wake-up call after collapsing from burnout in 2014 and launched Thrive Global in 2016 to end the collective delusion that burnout is the price we must pay for success. Padmasri Warrior is the CEO and founder of Fable, which is hosting today's amazing conversation. A longtime leader in business and tech, her career highlights include roles as the CTO at Cisco and Motorola and the CEO of the electric car company, Neo in the United States, and an advisory role on the boards of Spotify and Microsoft. Padma was recently included in the Forbes annual 50 over 50 list of top entrepreneurs and has previously been named to the Forbes most powerful women list. Padma's most recent venture is Fable, a social reading platform that centers around the mental health benefits of reading. I personally host a career coaching club on Fable for women leaders, and it is a awesome platform for building communities and sharing ideas and the joy and the power of reading together. Padma's book club on Fable will begin reading Thrive by Ariana Huffington together this month with a special focus on relieving stress and burnout in our own lives. And so if you haven't already, please join this club to start reading and discussing the, uh, the book Thrive. And on the Fable app, you're able not only to read and share some of the the highlights that you love in the book, but you can start conversations with other readers right inside the book. So it's a wonderful place to connect and share ideas and actions with each other as you read. And from someone who's read Thrive and quotes Thrive even in my own book, it is an amazing, amazing read. It is absolutely a must do for this season. So Ariana Padma, I am so excited to share this conversation with you and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Kelly and Ariana. So good to see you again. Uh, we have been good friends for, we were just talking over a decade now, almost 15 years. And it's a great pleasure to be with Ariana and Kelly. You're yourself an amazing author and a speaker. So, so glad that you're able to join us as well. Thank you. Yes, it's really great also. We should celebrate, Kelly, the fact that your book came out yesterday, Closing the Confidence Bug book closing the confidence gap boost your peace your potential and your paycheck yes. i love it and Thank congratulations you. there is nothing like publication day yes <laughs> yes so exciting thank you so much for your support i appreciate it it is a wonderful day and it's even better that i get to talk to both of you today <laughs> awesome Ariana, I'd love to start with you. You know, your book, Thrive, is so open and vulnerable about your own experiences with burnout and what led to Thrive and Thrive Global. Can you talk a bit about what made you a passionate advocate for well being? In fact, the book starts with my own wake up call when I uh, literally collapsed from sleep deprivation and burnout, hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone. It was. Um, in 2005, April 2005, uh, two years into building the Huffington Post, I was the divorced mother of two daughters. And I had bought into the collective delusion that I'm now working to um, end, that in order to succeed, you have to burn out. That's the price for success. And I wrote the book, it came out in 2014, two years before I left the Huffington Post to start Thrive as a behavior change company, because I wanted to help people realize that we have to redefine success. That's the subtitle of the book. 
the third metric of defining success beyond the first two metrics, which are money and status slash power. And the theme of the book was that you cannot be defined by your job. Mm -hmm. The first two metrics are job metrics. And the truth is that much though, the three of us are very lucky to be doing jobs we love, we are not our jobs. If I stopped being CEO of Thrive, or you stopped being a great coach and author of Padma, stopped being CEO of Able, we would not disappear. <laughs> you know, our identity is much more than that. And um, it includes what I call the third leg of the stool, the third metric, which is first of all, our well being and health, because without it, um, life is not really what it can be. Our capacity to um, enjoy life, uh, be connected to the mystery of life, connect to our own wisdom and give back. Mm -hmm. And that's a complete life. You know, Greek philosophers called it the good life. Mm -hmm. And we reduce the good life to a successful life and we reduce success to just two metrics. And we are now in the middle of this incredible redefinition you know, there is a lot of emphasis on the breakdowns right now, you know, the great re resignation, quite quitting, but the breakdowns are just symptoms of a huge reevaluation, a once in a generation opportunity to redefine how we work and live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So great. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that you said, and I encourage everyone who's listening is you described that it can be hard to separate what we do from who we are. And I hope as everyone is planning for the end of the year, things get busy, that they're including that third metric. It's so beautiful how you describe, like we think a lot about you know the, the status and the money, but there's this, there's this third thing we also have to keep aware of so that we don't collapse into burnout. Mm -hmm. So Padma, you started with a similar goal in mind to improve mental well-being via reading. And studies have shown that reading is amazing for mental and emotional well-being mm -hmm. and has a host of health and wellness benefits. Can you tell us a bit about those and kind of the genesis of Fable? Yeah, I, you know, I'm an engineer by training and I've always worked in the tech industry in pretty hardcore technical roles. Um, you know, I was CTO for Cisco where I was leading teams of 26,000 people worldwide. And currently I serve on the boards of Microsoft and Spotify. Uh, one of the largest companies in the world and one of the most uh, popular companies in, in the consumer world with Spotify. I mean, my world has always been tech and, and technology, but what I realized is um, there is benefits in actually, there are things we do in our lives that make us better at whatever domain we are experts in, right? And so I think for me, uh, this realization was when I was at Cisco leading large teams. I realized as a leader, there are certain things you can do that could lead to burnout, not just for yourselves, but for your teams. And there are certain other things you could do that encourage everyone to take a deep breath once in a while, right? And so it's always been, I think, at the, at the, at the core of what I believed in. Um, but I, you know, when I was at NEO, we were developing a lot of uh, AI and ML for cars to be automated and eventually be self-driving. And I thought like all this technology we were developing, there has to be a way we could apply this more directly to benefit us and our well-being. Um, so I left NEO to kind of go figure that out and work on that. And in the beginning, I was actually looking at very complicated health tech problems like computational radiology, computational pathology, how could we use AI and ML uh, to, to help pathologists find cancer faster? Mm -hmm. And these are all important problems. But as I was researching health more broadly, I kept coming across reports that were talking about how mental wellness is on the decline, right? So not mental illness, but mental wellness. So things like anxiety, stress, uh, depression, loneliness, feeling overwhelmed, feeling burnt out, feeling a lack of self-worth, all these things um, causes stress. And by the way, today is uh, Stress Awareness Day. And sometimes we don't even recognize the symptoms of what's happening. We, it's, it's too late by the time, like Ariana's case, right? By the time you realize you're burnt out, you're already burnt out. And it's very mm -hmm. difficult to like know those symptoms. 
Uh, so while we may, may not be able to fix it completely, there are certainly tools we can have that allows us to take care of ourselves from, from a mental wellness perspective before things become a problem. So I started to do research, I uh, left Neo, I dedicated six months of my time to just research. I mean, I'm an engineer, I love like to dig into problems and try to quantify problems. And I kept coming across a lot of research. Now there's a lot of neuroscience that supports how stories are actually beneficial to us. And actually anecdotally, it makes sense, right? Like for if you've ever had a child or, or, or been part of another child's life in some way or another, we know children love stories. Um, you know, I mean, like I used to read to my son when he was a baby and every night he would like, oh, one more story, tell me one more story. And so as children, we are fascinated by stories because our mind imagines whatever is happening in that story. But the same thing continues as adults. When we read a story or when we listen to a story, even when we watch a story, our brain puts us inside that story. We sometimes laugh out loud, sometimes we cry. Um, you know, I grew up in India and I learned a lot about countries outside of India through books. Um, you know, maybe in some ways, even my coming to the US was triggered by the fact that I read so many stories that were set in the United States and I imagined what the landscape could be here, um, which made me work harder to make my dreams come true and be here one day. Mm -hmm. So all of this, there's a ton of research that talks about, uh, there's a paper out of Yale that talks about how reading 30 minutes a day will prolong our life by two years, all other things being equal. And, you know, 15 to 30 minutes a day is not a lot of time, right? Like we spend that much time just doom scrolling on um, social media apps that are toxic. And if you just take that 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day and read something like Thrive, which is a great book, and you discuss it with communities that are share that same interest, that goes a long way in improving our mental health. And so I started Fable to create a platform for communities to choose great books and read them together. Yeah. I want, it's, and it is wonderful. I'm on it. And I think the unique thing and the thing I keep coming back to in what you said is read them together. Yes. Because, you know, stories are so powerful because we can see ourselves in the story and then we can talk about the story and discuss it all together. And just what a powerful way that you've just described to foster connection. Yeah. Isn't that true? Like sometimes you and I are, are and I will read the same thing and I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that. You know, you thought of that. And that suddenly opens my mind, right? Like it makes us much more open-minded when we are sharing insights with each other as we are reading. I love that. I even have, you know, I became a grandma. I have a two month old grandson and it's kind of amazing how you can sit there and uh, I don't know if read is the right word, but show him pages of books and he's totally fascinated and looking and I do read him. I, I love particularly reading him Good Night Moon yeah. because I think it's such a psychologically wise book. Yes, fact, I, I did a parody of it for Audible called Goodnight Smartphone <laughs> because we all need that um, um, separation from our daily lives to be able to surrender to sleep. And that's really what Goodnight Moon captures so brilliantly. Yeah. yeah. What a wonderful metaphor too with a baby, right? Maybe like when we really think about living the third metric and you know being mental well-being, we just need to go back to when we were babies. Read stories and sleep. <laughs> Two yeah. things that they love the most, sleep and, and be read to. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of books, Ariana, I know you're a voracious reader and you even recommended several books to favor a uh, fable ahead of this talk today. You know, what do you look for before you pick up a book and decide to read it? So I I am a voracious reader. I mean, if you uh, turned the camera here, you would see a, a wall-to-wall -wall bookcase. And I have a really hard time parting with books. I, I love reading real books mm -hmm. and I love underlining them. I almost cannot read without a pen. <laughs> yeah. And then it's amazing going back to books you read like, 30 years ago and seeing what you underline and what you're thinking at the time. I love, because I mostly read at night, you know, before I go to sleep, unless it's the weekend, 
I like to read books that have nothing to do with work. Over the weekend, I, I like to read books on work trends and media, etc. But at night, I love to read books on philosophy, poetry, spirituality, uh, books that transport me to another dimension. Uh, I think this is so important to have some connection to that deeper dimension of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now, Mark Nepo is one of my favorite modern poets. So I love reading his book. I also have a book on my nightstand, which I've had forever, which is a book called Meditations, but it's written by Marcus Aurelius, who was emperor of Rome for 19 years, 13 of which he had to deal with a terrible plague. Um, but he was also a Stoic philosopher. So it's really an amazingly philosophical book on leadership. In fact, on my desk here, I have a statue of Marcus <laughs> oh. Aurelius. He's a real inspiration to me because after all the the key to leadership is how can you remain unflappable and in the eye of the hurricane, mm -hmm. no matter what happens, because there is no there is no job, certainly no leadership job that doesn't include challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I love kind of um, learning and going deeper uh, when I read books. I, mm -hmm. uh, if I want to have fun and just read like, and just have like, um, things that are just fun i i tend to watch streaming things on my treadmill mm -hmm. that way i get some value from it like if i watch billions of succession or tell me lies or bad sisters all of which i have watched on my treadmill thank god otherwise i would be about 300 pounds <laughs> <laughs> oh i love it Oh, and I love just how you just it just expressed to all of us, like you read all of these books for grounding, all of these resources for, you know, remaining resilient and flappable in the, the face of challenges. And there's still room for fun and moving your body, which is also really important to mental health and well-being. So what a beautiful Absolutely. picture of just how well-rounded that is. You know, Kelly, one of the one of our key micro steps that thrive on the Thrive platform is based on the idea of habit stacking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to do something like watch fun streaming videos, uh, can you do it while you are getting value mm -hmm. as opposed to sitting on your couch um, eating popcorn or worse? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Such a awesome. good tip. It is so good. So Padma, same question for you. What do you look for in a book and how do you pick the books that you read in your club, which has over a thousand members, you've had some good books that you've read in there. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I, I read a lot of fiction. I uh, prefer to uh, read fiction to business books mostly, right? You know, there are, in my club, we alternate. We choose one fiction, one, uh, one business book. Um, but yeah, I mean, by the way, we're going to be reading Ariana's book, Thrive Next, in my club. And she's written many books, which I've read many of them, but Thrive is my favorite because I just feel like you get to know Ariana, but you get to know as she talks about uh, your true identity and how to focus on it. So we'll be reading that together next. So for those of you interested in joining, there is a link in chat. Please join us. Um, so I love my favorite genre is sci-fi and fantasy fiction, because I think it allows us in many cases, I feel like sci-fi and fantasy fiction allows us to imagine what a future might be like, right? And, um, and sometimes it is a story about using technology, but it's sometimes about world building. And I feel like when we read these genres, that world building and the characters we read about, they're very human because it's us who are writing it. And so, but it's in, in a very extrapolated way that I think allows us to explore concepts like greed, power, how power, power corrupts, you know, like Tolkien is my favorite, favorite author. Mm -hmm. um, and who's like, in some ways, the father of fantasy fiction in many people who have written uh, amazing writers in that genre, look up to him and feel like he created that genre, but he's such a master at 
uh, you know, if you were a Lord of the Rings fan and watched that movie or read the book, you sort of like know that one ring that corrupts the whole world, right? Like this is the how power and greed corrupt us as human beings. Um, so that's my favorite genre. So what I look for is beautiful writing. Uh, there are certain writers I feel whose words move me. I often cry when I read a great book. Uh, I feel like that is so much power with words to evoke so much emotion in us as human beings. So I look for that. I'm right now reading in another smaller club I have on paper, uh, we're reading a book called The Map of uh, Stars and Seas. It's a beautifully beautiful bully written book. Um, it tells the stories of two young women that are coming of age, uh, but set thousands of years apart. So I like stories like that. Um, that are often about human beings, but you know, extrapolating who we are as human beings in a different context. I love poetry as well. I usually read poetry in the morning. Um, for me, when I wake up, I get my cup of coffee. My morning routine is I wake up in the morning, grab my cup of coffee. Um, I sit down and I read on Fable. And I know I'm a big, I used to be a big print book reader, but now I read on Fable because I love to read with a community. Um, so we have an amazing poetry book club. Uh, the moderator is a great uh, poet herself and chooses great poetry books. We just finished a collection of poetry called Reparations Now. Um, and the poet actually participated as, with us in the club. Um, so usually in the morning, I'll read two to three poems. It doesn't take very long. By the time I finish my cup of coffee, I've read three poems. Then I get to work and I take breaks, uh, micro breaks between meetings and I go to Fable and I read, right? So at lunchtime, I take a half an hour break because nowadays I'm at least I'm working uh, from home. I take a half an hour break. I grab a sandwich uh, and I read while I'm uh, eating. And uh, this is, you know, James Clear talks about habit stacking, right? Like we do an activity with another activity. So that's sort of how I keep up with my reading. But I actually read four or five books all at the same time. You know, I think my brain is one of those. I find, by the way, I'd love to know from the audience on chat. I find many people do that. I'm not one of those people that will read one book, finish it, read another book. Um, I like to read. Sometimes, like, I'll go read you know, Atomic Habits, then I'm reading a sci-fi book and I'm reading a poetry book. Um, that's kind of how I, so I'm in like five or six clubs all of, all at the same time. And the beauty on Fable is that it lets you read at your own pace, there's no pressure. Um, so yeah, I'm seeing lots of comments. Yeah, yeah, definitely I feel most people read multiple books all at the same time. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I love, fiction. I think that's my favorite. But I also love great books like Thrive and Atomic Habits and books like this that talk about how we can become better people and better leaders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I read your book. My... You sent me a free, a free uh, copy of your book, which is a great book, um, Closing the Confidence Gap. I think it's so applicable to women, right? Like women, especially all of us have this imposter syndrome or confidence question. And I think your book addresses that. So I love reading that book as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm laughing because I have a morning book and an afternoon book. <laughs> but something that I, that you both said that was just, I really observed, I, th I thought was powerful. And I just want to highlight this for our audience is that there's no one right book to read to improve your wellness. Like there's this whole genre, but what I heard from both of you is you choose books that move you. Like you both talked about like how they make you feel in your body, where they make you feel grounded, whether they make you feel resilient, whether they make you feel like you said, they, they make you cry, they evoke emotion. And so, you know, that's just something I want readers to think about is, you know, if you haven't found that genre yet, keep reading because, you know, there's just a lot more benefits from reading books than just learning, right? It's really evoking like these bodily responses, which are so healthy to your well being. And you both just shared that beautifully about how it just, it moves you versus just for learning, which is another good thing too. So a question. I, I know Ariana is always telling me like, you should write a book. You should write a book. And I'm <laughs> like, I just love reading books. I don't know if I want to write a book. Uh, Ariana is very you can, do, you can do both, right? <laughs> yep, yeah, you, you can, can do both. both. Done both. It's amazing. You can uh, do both. I'll be your yeah. biggest fan. Yeah. So I have a question for both of you, whoever wants to go first is fine, but you know what, the pandemic, let's talk about this. It's been terrible for mental health in many ways. However, it has led to more awareness about mental well-being and the importance of our mental health. 
Are there any stress relieving tactics you developed during the pandemic that you hope to maintain? Hmm. Great question. I mean, I'm happy to go first. Um, I think there are several things for me. I mean, by the way, it's not just the pandemic, right? I think I would say actually right now is the most stressful time I feel we are in. You know, there's a threat of war. Who knows? That could be like, you know, all bets of, are off if that happens. Uh, we're, we're at a 40 year high in inflation, we're facing a recession. I think the markets are so volatile and uncertain now and people are worried about jobs. I feel like right now is the moment of very stressful times for all of us. Um, but there are, I think, certain things that lifestyle-wise that I have made changes that truly help me with dealing with stress. And that is getting into this habit of making micro breaks work. Um, even if we were to physically be back in offices, like I used to work at a crazy pace before. Um, I think one of the things that I'll always do and I recommend everyone to do, building 10 minute breaks between your work meetings or wherever you're going, don't just go back to back to back. Actually, Microsoft has done and published research that says when you take a break for 10 minutes between one meeting to another meeting, you actually function better. Because otherwise you're going one, I mean, this happens to all of us. I used to go meeting to meeting and I'm like, okay, what is the agenda in this meeting? Was I supposed to have read some pre-read or not? Who are the people in this meeting? Do I know them? I think our brain is like trying to work over time and just taking a 10 minute pause allows you to like catch your breath. So that's something I'm definitely keeping up. I've gotten in the habit, I would say, like Ariana said, you know, she's on a treadmill watching shows. I go for long walks and I listen to audio podcasts and book stories. I, my favorite podcast is the New Yorker Fiction Podcast. I highly recommend it. It's a free podcast. It's available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. And basically, um, they pick authors who've written stories on the New Yorker and ask them to pick another author's story and read it out aloud. And then they do a Q and A. It's my favorite thing to listen to when I go for long walks. It's usually an hour long and I walk like three miles in an hour and I like complete it. And I feel like, okay, I did my walk. I listened to a great story. I heard a great author. That's something I'm definitely keeping as a hobby. Uh, physically, I've really gotten into Pilates now and I'm loving it. Somebody said they do Pilates in the chat, mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, awesome. Um, I think those are the three things that I feel that I do that definitely have given me more resilience mentally, physically, and it goes together, right? I'm sure Ariana will agree. Physical, mental health is all tied together. It's so tied together. Mm -hmm. uh, I've realized that. And I've always painted and I'm now making more time to paint. I've gotten into making jewelry, like learning new mm -hmm. skills. Uh, this is my latest hobby. <laughs> So I have like crazy hobbies. And they're gorgeous. Uh, yeah, yeah, I post my jewelry pictures on my Instagram and yeah, all of these things that I feel I want to keep with me. So for me, um, I feel kind of lucky because um, Thrive, the platform and our business working with many companies around the world is all about helping people reduce stress. Mm -hmm. So I learn new things all the time. Um, we are not a consumer product. We are only a B2B product, but obviously all Thrivers have access to our platform. And what I have learned which is similar to what Padma said, is uh, that you need to meet people in the middle of work, in the workflow, in order to be able to sustainably reduce stress. And that's what we do with the Thrive platform. Um, starting in the morning, and I do all that, you know, with a, what do we call a pulse check, just uh, one question. We have about 50 that alternate. Some are personal, what's your energy level? Some are more about your work. And then depending on, on how I answer, if I say that my energy is low or uh, say something about work, I get relevant micro steps and content mm -hmm. uh, personalized. And then all the different micro steps across every journey of our daily life, sleep, food, movement, 
uh, focus, which is our relationship with our phone and social media and connection. So micro steps across all these different journeys. And we actually published a book of our micro steps called Time to Thrive. And, um, and then stories, you know, again, back to stories. You know, we all need stories to be inspired, empowered. So with every company we work with, um, the people who uh, use the platform are encouraged to write a story about what has helped them, what are they doing, what micro step are they using. And at Walmart, we actually um, take these stories and um, um, run a competition and um, people get financial awards. Walmart gives Thrive a million dollars a year to distribute in financial awards. So the idea is to use every means at our disposal, including financial incentives to help people do the right thing for their health and their well-being. And, um, and then the deep dives, which is more like a book, you know, the in the learn tab, you can have a deep dive on mental health or on nutrition or on children. And so there is everything from 30 second um, micro steps, 60 second resets, which is all that it takes to move from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, all the way to uh, deep dives, more like reading a book about key topics. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. wonderful. Right. And it's just so powerful that you keep using micro steps, micro steps, because I think sometimes, and probably the nature of our world and hustle culture, we think that for stress management, I need to meditate for 30 minutes. But I just want to really, you know, land that point home that these are little things, 60 second things, 10 minute reading breaks. And that's just so attainable for folks. And so thank you for, for highlighting just how simple that can be. Yeah, I think it's a very powerful concept that James Clear calls uh, atomic habits, right? Like habit building happens, not by just like deciding, okay, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. That's not going to happen. You have to like run and build up and, you know, think of yourself as a runner. I love his book, by the way, we just finished reading it in, in my club. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the second time I'm reading it and this I totally buy into the concept of atomic habits and he talks about habit stacking. Um, I think all these things are very, very true in our personal life, but also in how we manage stress at work. 100%. Yeah, so Ariana, is, oh, go ahead. No, there is amazing science, you know, like James Clear, whom I love, BJ Fogg at Stanford has written a book called Tiny Habits, which I highly recommend. He chairs our scientific board and he's worked with us to develop the journeys that take you from micro steps to healthy habits. Mm -hmm. You know, 30 seconds or 60 seconds in the morning before you go to your phone begins to build that healthy habit of not rushing to your phone before before your feet have hit the ground, before you're fully awake, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know all of us could probably stand some improvement with our phone habits and I'll yeah. just go first and say, that's me. So Ariana, kind of following up on this, earlier this year, Thrive Global created a pledge through which employers commit to keeping employee mental health and wellness benefits that were created during the pandemic. And over 115 companies signed on, including Salesforce, Uber, Pfizer, and Fable, of course. Can you talk to us more about that pledge and what it aims to achieve? So, you know, as, as we're conscious of the downturn and hiring freezes and layoffs, we thought this would be the time to make sure that companies do not regress. Mm -hmm. uh, companies prioritized well-being and mental health. But, you know, like with every fundamental cultural transformation, you have companies that are trailblazers and companies lagging behind. And we wanted to create a sense of uh, urgency around the importance of maintaining mental health benefits, especially actually during a downturn because people are facing so many challenges. And, uh, and to also make the connection to business metrics. 
to productivity, to healthcare costs. And we were amazed by the response, you know, literally within a few days, we had so many signatories. We took a full page New York Times ad and, um, and it's become part of the conversation and something that we are monitoring together with SHRAM and, um, and making sure that people stay on their commitments. Mm -hmm. That's such a wonderful um, thing to consider that this is something that we need to sustain for the long haul and not just because the pandemic mandated it. And, and Padma, you highlighted this beautifully. So I think some folks, and I'd love to hear what folks feel in the chat, they're a little more stressed out now. Mm -hmm. So to that end, you know, what really inspired you to sign on Fable for this pledge? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely the mental wellness movement is begun. And I think people are now recognizing, I don't think now we need to like, sell it as a leadership priority. People recognize it, right? I actually just wrote, a, it's actually amazing to me when I meet leaders and they say like, it's a big revelation. You know, I discovered that if I am <laughs> kind and empathetic to my employees, they're more loyal and they'll stay with us longer. I'm like, really? <laughs> this is news to you? Yeah. At the end of the day, we have to treat our teams like they're human beings. And, you know, as human beings, we're all stressed out. Something or the other is always causing us stress, right? Like that's what makes us human on the one hand. Um, and so I think recognizing that people are not robots when they come to work we can't put the genie back in the bottle, right? Like last two years, we've all worked from home. So we've seen the people that are on Zoom calls, their children come into the Zoom call, their pets coming and we like, and are they taking care of a senior person at home? And we can't suddenly forget that, like just because the pandemic is over, we now know the, the real people behind the job title. And so that genie is out of the bottle. And so as leaders, I think to me, it is, it's not surprising that you have to treat your team members like they're human beings. And part of being human is focusing on a holistic wellness and mental wellness is a big part of it. Um, so I am actually super thrilled. And the reason, you know, I think I was thrilled when Ariana messaged me and said, hey, we are doing this. I'm like, it took me a nanosecond to say, yeah, of course we'll sign this and be part of the collective, I think as a company, but even as leaders, we should speak up more about this. And there is still stigma attached to saying I need help uh, with mental wellness. I think that is that something we should get rid of. Look, I think physical fitness is now a daily habit, right? Like it started 10, 15 years ago, that movement. Companies now have gyms at their workplaces or they give you gym membership if they don't have gyms on their campus to go work out and take care of your physical health. Mental wellness is the same thing. Companies have to invest um, in their team's mental wellness if they want to retain and and uh, have happy employees. And so I think that's something that I feel like this movement has begun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think now it's up to all of us to make that movement become a large movement and become a leadership priority for the next decade and beyond. Um, I mean, the good news is I think the younger people coming into the workforce are removing that stigma. You know, I think that is a great, I think my generation, it was a taboo to say, oh, I'm burnt out or I'm stressed out at work. And so like Ariana started off the conversation, we all thought we were like braving it out by burning out. It was like a badge of honor, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. no longer the case. I think, you know, people want to draw lines and set boundaries, which is a great thing. Um, in my company, we do a lot of rituals to allow us all to be human at work. And so I think it's just building that into the company culture. That's super important. Yep. And so one of the favorite rituals um, that I love that you talk about is your fika. I hope <laughs> I'm saying that right. Where you give everybody a prompt. Do you, do you mind if you share what was your fika prompt this week or today? Yeah, I, I think last week it you was put it in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, it was about Halloween. I think we talked about scary movies and horror movies last week, but there are some, so, some amazing prompts that, yeah, so we basically, what we do is every Friday, um, we pick an hour and it's part of what we do. It's like, 
like our operations reviews, our town company meetings, it's one of these things and employees take turns and they come up with a prompt, they share with the whole company and people respond to that prompt. And the prompts are super fun. Like, what are you hoarding in your pantry that you should throw away that you haven't thrown away? Ooh, I want to see the chat <laughs> light up on that. <laughs> that was a very popular prompt. People were bringing show and tell, like one person had one gummy bear they were hoarding in their pantry. They would yeah. throw away. And, <laughs> um, well, and like, look, we're all laughing, which is like stress relief. And so yeah. I just wanted to highlight, this is so simple and something that you can do. And, you know, here you are leading the charge and this is the type of companies that, that folks are going to want to work for someday. And it's just yes. so simple. And I'm sure everybody, we can't see them is laughing right now about things expired in their pantries. So I know we all do that, right? It doesn't matter, you know, how big your home is or how small your pantry is. <laughs> we all have that thing in the refrigerator or the pantry that we should throw away. <laughs> we haven't thrown away. That was one of the prompts. The other prompt was like, if you could wish for one skill, what would it be? You know, so not superpower, but skill. So interesting things like that, that allows us to laugh and share and, you know, share pictures and it's super fun. I, I really look forward to our Pika every Friday. Yeah. Well, and this just leads us into a next perfect question for both of you, whoever wants to go first, you know, stress management techniques. We just did one. We laughed, but stress management techniques are so important to prevent burnout. But do you have any recommendations for someone who is already experiencing burnout? Mm, yeah, let Ariana go first this time. Uh, well, um, absolutely. I mean, the first thing is recognizing it. Mm -hmm. Because what is amazing, like, is that if you had asked me the day I collapsed, Ariana, how are you? I would have said fine. Yeah. Um, first of all, in many companies where hassle culture prevails, being perpetually exhausted is seen as like, well, that's the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, burnout is seen even as the price of success. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is recognizing it. And then knowing that we can get out of that cycle. And um, there is a sort of primary habit for each one of us that is key. Mine is definitely sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote a whole book on it. And that's what they call the keystone habit. And if you are burnt out, increasing the amount of sleep is going to be absolutely key. And as much as possible, letting yourself sleep without an alarm clock and creating a transition to sleep because sometimes people are exhausted and they go to sleep, especially if they are burnt out, but they haven't learned to slow down their brain. Mm -hmm. So they wake up in the middle of the night and then it's hard to go back to sleep. So learning to create a transition to sleep with um, even again, micro step, even if you have a five minute transition, but the more burnt out you feel, the longer the transition should be. Mm -hmm. And that includes, you know, a hot bath or a hot shower, reading a book in bed that doesn't have anything to do with work. All these things kind of mean that you're going to be able to get a deeper night's sleep. Mm -hmm and be able to wake up more recharged and, and gradually uh, get out of that cycle. You know, food is important, you know, reducing sugar and processed foods uh, helps reduce inflammation, which also contributes to burnout. Uh, movement, uh, even if you're not used to working out regularly, walking. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you can do in this, small incremental ways to turn things around. But for me, it's incredibly important for everybody to be very optimistic about this. You know, um, it's our birthright to have a place of peace, strength, and wisdom at our center. We just need to keep tapping into it more and more often so that when we get dressed, stressed, we can quickly course correct. Because let's face it, stress is inevitable. I mean, everybody has stress in their lives, but burnout and cumulative stress are avoidable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Padma, what about you? Yeah, I think I totally agree with that. I think, like I said, in some ways you could argue stress is what makes us human, 
right? Because we get stressed because we're thinking about something, we're worrying about something. Uh, but I think what is harmful is letting that spiral out of control and without us realizing it, that happens too. And I thought, so how do you stop it from spiraling out of control? I think that's the trick. Um, I don't think, I think by the time you recognize and control it, it's too late, I would argue. It's like people say, if you're thirsty, that means you should have drank water an hour ago, right? Because by the time you're thirsty, your body is already telling you you need water. Uh, so you should continue to drink water before you're thirsty. And so same thing with stress. I think you should continue to manage stress every day, every second, before you get to realizing you're stressed out. Um, and so how do you do that? I think you just have to build it into your lifestyle. That's what I found. Um, it's not like you should wait and say, oh, I'm stressed out. It's Friday night. I just need to like go to the bar and get a drink. By then it's too late, right? Like it's that you're thirsty then. And so you need to like be doing that throughout the week. Um, I think my biggest a realization that I'd like to share with people is like all of these things matter. So I think just set yourself a goal of 1% improvement every single day, like, you know, sleep a minute longer, you know, if you are not getting enough sleep or if you're trying to eat healthy, which is really hard, by the way, I think it's really, really hard for, for most of us, um, you know, just saying, okay, like today I will replace whatever carbs I'm eating for lunch with a salad and maybe a fruit. I think it's like just doing one little thing. I, you know, I'll read like five minutes today. I'll read 10 minutes tomorrow. I think those are things that I think are essential. You know, I, I have to be honest, I think during COVID, I fell off my routine for working out because I used to be physically like really working out a lot when I was before COVID. After COVID, because like, because I do things when I'm in a group, I do things more when I'm in a community. So although I have a treadmill at home, it was like really hard for me alone to get on a treadmill. So I kind of fell off the fitness wagon. I wanted to get back into it. And now I go for Pilates. But it's one of those things mindset wise, like I had to start small and I had to say, okay, I'll go one day a week. I mean, like, because I'm one of those A type personality, like, okay, I'm going to get fit like in a week. I'm going to do yeah. Pilates like for two hours every single day. That's not going to happen. Um, and I think being realistic and setting yourself realistic goals and don't wait to manage stress by the time stress is stress, it's too late. I think just start working on healthy habits every single day. I think that's what is important. The we only thing I would say is that obviously that's ideal, you know, to be able to prevent something, whatever it is, should always be our goal. But I don't want anybody who is stressed or burned out, who is listening to, to think that they are yeah. being low because I think I, I've, I've known and we work with so many people who are burnt out, who are deeply stressed and very quickly they can turn things around if yes. they are committed to changing habits. So I think it's important for everybody to know that and there are so many tools and techniques and good books to help us on the journey. Yeah, asking, I think, like I said, it's, uh, you know, the, there's a thing now, right? Like it's okay to say you're not okay. I think that's absolutely true, mm -hmm. absolutely. When you both just highlighted so beautifully too, one, being able to recognize it and not, and recognizing when maybe you're caught up in a culture of hustle and burnout mm -hmm. and learning to discern the two, because we've kind of talked about this, that good thing is cultures are changing, right? And we're no longer buying into this message, which thank you, Ariana, for making this okay to talk about. But I just want to highlight again, that's so important for us to just stop and just ask ourselves how we're feeling. And am I buying into that, that culture? Because that awareness, just like you said, Ariana, is just, is huge. And that's something I know I talk with women a lot as well. That way you can catch it earlier and not, yeah. and not later. Absolutely. That is key. Mm -hmm. So we're entering into a year, um, you know, it's just the time of the year where the days are getting darker. We've got a lot of holiday commitments. And so sometimes motivation can be low sadness can, you know, seasonal effectiveness disorder can come on, um, you know, depression. Do you have any tips that we can use for maintaining your mental health during the winter? Yeah, I think to me, uh, doing the things you love. And again, you know, say if you are burnt out, if you are stressed out, call it and take the time to invest in yourself. 
you know, there is, I think at the end of the day, uh, there are tools available, there are people available to all of us. There are friends even that will help us, right? Like, um, you know, like I said, just to acknowledge it. Like, you know, I have a big ego. It took me a long time to acknowledge like, oh, I'm not physically fit. I need to like get back into it because I kind of fell off the wagon during COVID. And then I had to work hard to get back into it. Um, I think don't, I think one thing I learned is sometimes I overcommit and now is the time to sort of like clean your, clean everything off your plate and focus on the important things. Don't try to take on like too many things. Thanksgiving is coming. You know, I'm sure people have commitments with their families. If that's important, make sure you're taking time off from work so you can focus on that. Um, I think prioritization and picking a few things so that you want to, you feel are important to you is now, now is the best time to do that, I feel. Yeah. Yes, and also I love what, um, what you said, Padma, about not taking on more than we can handle. Uh, I, ever since um, I founded the Huffington Post and then moving on to Thrive, I had this... Um, holiday tradition of giving everybody sweaters that I handpicked and and then PJs that I handpicked and it became as we grew and grew it became like a real holiday uh, undertaking so uh, last year we started just giving people tea's best cards which I love you give people a giving card and they can spend the money however they want for a non-profit and then they write a story of how they spent the money. So A, it was wonderful because I don't think we are talking enough about how giving is an incredible way to also reduce stress and uh, an amazing um, way for self-care. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also um, encourages people to put their own problems in perspective to do something for others. And it definitely reduces uh, the amount of stress I go through picking presents for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that brings up such a good point. And I want to bring in one question for the chat as we end this conversation today. It's been wonderful. And someone asked about boundaries, right? And we talk about gifts and all the presents and all the things that we have to do, the gift giving and all the obligations. So I would love for you each to maybe just tell us in a few words, how important do you feel boundary setting is during the holidays? And do you have a quick tip we can use? I think it's very important to set boundaries. To me, setting boundaries is nothing but prioritizing, right? In some ways, um, meaning like you decide, okay, I'm going to do this and not this, whatever that is. Like, you know, I think different people have different ways we relax in. For me, Thanksgiving is a big thing. My whole family gets together. It's one holiday I spend a lot of energy and time on. Uh, I love to cook, so I go all out. And so to me, that's important. So I make time for it. Um, for other people, it might be, um, you know, giving back in some other way. Um, we also, after Thanksgiving meal, go and do some community service together as a family. I think whatever your your motivated by and whatever gives you joy I think prioritizing that is nothing more than setting boundary mm -hmm. you know boundaries can also be set without being too rigid by the way mm -hmm. uh, what do I mean by that you know it's sort of like I always talk about integration um, not balance for work and family because to me balance always suggests perfection like somehow you're expected to especially for women uh, you're expected to be a perfect mom a perfect uh, you know co-worker perfect boss and you know perfect at everything you look perfect and you act perfect there's no such thing in life and you know I think we're all imperfect as human beings and I think a boundary just means like Someday I'm going to prioritize my family. Another day I'll prioritize my work. And if I prioritize my work, it doesn't mean I'm a bad mom. It just means that work is important that day. Uh, another day I may miss a meeting because I want to do something with my family. And, and that's okay too. Your boss should recognize that. Um, so I always talk about integration, which is all about moving boundaries and having flexi 
flexible boundaries that allows you to prioritize what is important to you. Um, so absolutely boundary setting is important to me. That just means prioritizing whatever in the moment is important to you. One moment, it may be work. One moment, next day, it may be family. Third day, it may be a community thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think all these are important. And often, by the way, we forget ourselves, right? Like, you know, I, I think of this as like four holes in a button. Like if you think of a button, community, yourself, your family, and your work, and all are important. Uh, that doesn't mean you divide 24 hours by four and spend six hours on each. Um, you know, I think it just means you're aware that all four are important to you and you are prioritizing each of those in your life at any given moment. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yes. I love that visual of the button. Ariana, <laughs> what about you for boundaries? Oh, I love that. I love that work-life balance is really impossible, but I love the idea of work-life integration because there will be days when work takes a priority and you have to say no to other things and days when family or uh, loved ones generally take a priority. So, but there's also kind of a larger boundary setting for me, which I describe as you can complete a project by dropping it. Mm. You know, sometimes we have all these incomplete projects in our heads uh, some who have started and some who haven't even started, but they still take bandwidth in our brain. Yeah. And I, I, I do regular audits and I complete projects like I wanted to become a good skier. Well, I realized I would never really invest the time and energy to become a good skier. So I've completed the skiing project by dropping it. <laughs> And love this. Say, you know, <laughs> felt like uh, made myself feel comfortable just going skiing with my daughters and sitting by the fire reading a good book while they're skiing. That's mm -hmm. what I do too. I take my sketchbook and I sketch while my husband and my son go skiing. Okay, we got to do it together then. <laughs> Absolutely. Drink I just love this. Yeah. I love like this conversation. This was the best bottom line I think we could have landed on is I think you gave everybody a permission slip that we can complete a project by dropping it when it is not a priority, as Padma said. And I think if we all just give ourselves permission just to ask ourselves that self-coaching question, is this even a priority? And yes. can I complete this by dropping it? Yeah. I hope we all breathe a collective sigh of relief. And thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you, Padma. It was such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I just want to direct you all to know that you can find out more about Ariana at thriveglobal.com. And you can find out more about the Fly Thrive Global as a company there as well. And do not forget to join Padma's book club on Fable. Yeah, actually, Jason, if you could share the QR code up on the screen, we are reading Ariana's book next. I would love for you guys to join the club and read with me and we can discuss more and I'm sure we can bug Ariana for her notes on that book. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything you need. I'm so excited that you're going to be reading Thrive. It is also my favorite book. Uh -huh. It's there my favorite book. There's the QR code if you guys want to scan it. That will bring you to my club and we'll be reading Thrive next. And uh, yeah, we can maybe get Ariana's uh, underlining uh, sections for that book and, <laughs> and share that with the club. Um, but wonderful. thank you, Kelly, for facilitating. And thank you, Ariana. Always wonderful to talk with you. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You. Hope to see you in Padma's Club. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Ariana. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Bye.